Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And, uh, and a special hello to Bernard and Joyce, because uh, yeah, I'm sure we all miss them. And uh, I was looking forward to seeing them this morning, because they're lovely people, aren't they? So, uh, anyway, it's, um, it's Acts chapter 3 I wanted to spend a bit of time with you uh, looking at um, this morning, because it's a bit of a bridgehead. It's, you, you get a feeling that you're on the brink of something. Um, something as we start reading the Acts of the Apostles as we've, as we've done. Although actually this is about... It's, not, it's, not, it's, it's less about the Acts of the Apostles, isn't it? It's about the further Acts of Jesus. The Apostles were the means by which Jesus, through Holy Spirit, was making the advancement of the kingdom gospel. Um, so it's through them rather than of them. And this is very much something that Peter, in the reading that we've just had, makes very plain. It's not about us making this man uh, uh, healed again. This is the work of Jesus. <coughs> so it brought to my mind this kind of um, really uh, important kind of transition period, really. We've got this transition period from when Jesus uh, is taken away, when Jesus is crucified and when he's raised again, these momentous events towards the end of the Gospels. And, the, and then at the beginning of Acts chapter 1, you know, he's off. That's it. Um, except it's not. Um, he's left them with a responsibility to carry on the ministry work of his father and of he. And he's left them, he's left them, but they're not alone, if you get the difference there, an important difference. <coughs> I'd like to um, link this Acts chapter 3 and 4 back to John's Gospel and uh, chapter 14, because there's one or two things that kind of occurred to me as we, as we talk about this that sort of link together. So we've got this transition period, as I say, and here we are at the brink of this new period. Jesus is gone, but he says, I'm not going to leave you alone. And in John chapter 14, we've got this moment of great kind of, I don't know, sadness really, where this dawns on the, uh, uh, the disciples that Jesus is not going to be around for too long. And he says in verse 1 through to 4 of John chapter 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. And if you just have a look here, um, he's speaking to the disciples, his closest disciples, to help kind of prepare them for the fact that he's not going to be with them uh, for much longer. And he's, and he's kind of trying to build them up. He's saying, listen, don't let your heart, don't worry. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 the verses flow on a little bit, all the way down to verse 14, really. Um, but in particular, if you have a look at, um, you know, that, that section, there's a context that follows on, really, in, the, in here and the rest of the, the Gospel of John here, which actually things were going to get a lot worse. Jesus is saying, don't let your hearts be troubled, but actually things were going to start to heat up quite considerably. So, because in the next few hours, or days at least, you know, Peter, for example, was about to collapse in his faith, wasn't he? He was going to deny that he even knew Jesus. Judas was about to collapse. Judas was about to betray that um, you know, everything to do with Jesus and to, and to sell him effectively to the highest bidder to be rid of him and even Jesus himself comes on to a period where he's in the garden and he says to his father Lord if this is possible uh, will you please let this hour pass so he, on one hand he's saying to the disciples don't let your hearts be troubled trust me and at the same time he knows what's happening around him and he, what's, what's, what's following on even to he himself personally where he says that if it's at all possible can this hour pass from me Father nevertheless what you will not what I will but it does show us something of Jesus doesn't it which is a wonderful thing which is the honesty of 
Jesus and the humanity of Jesus. You know, with Jesus it's not just a sort of easy to say, easy to do kind of thing. This is not easy to do, Jesus. And we see this in, in, in this um, passage of time. Nevertheless, Jesus says that I will have to leave you. He's going. In my Father's house, and many I will, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back, and so on. And you know the way I'm going. And he introduces this kind of little uh, conversation piece between the disciples. And for the disciples then, and obviously for us now, it becomes a question of trust and confidence in the promise that Jesus says, I will not leave you alone. I will still be with you. And learning to trust that, and also to live as though you really believe it, is part of our faith journey, isn't it? It's part of our development. It's part of us trying to square that in our mind and try to live experience, good times, not so good times, to put that into practice and see whether we can really hold on to that. You know, it's a life experience thing to trust that Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you alone, but I will be with you. Thomas, in this chapter 14, wanted more information. Um, he said, well, hold on a minute, Jesus, we don't know where you're going, and if we did, can we tell us more information? He almost wanted a road map of what was going to be happening. Can you be clearer for us here, Jesus, he's saying. And Jesus' message is to say, listen, Thomas and others, you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to trust me and to know that the one in whom you can trust also has the full authority of the creator God in heaven. Because if you see me, you see God. When, you know, we are one in this. So if you can trust me, you can also trust the Father. And it brings these things together in this, <coughs> in this passage in John chapter 14. And it's a really difficult thing, isn't it? It's a very, very difficult thing to trust the promise that Jesus says, you won't visibly see me, but, but I'm still with you. And that's particularly difficult in times where, it's, you know, where, where, where suffering happens, or where illness happens, or where things go bad in our lives, as they do. How do we cling on to that promise? People do say, well, where is God when there is suffering? And it's probably the most difficult question to answer, isn't it? I think we should just be honest and say, we don't know. We don't know why this has happened or that has happened or why it seems as though God is allowing this to happen or not preventing it or, or whatever else. And we don't have those answers. And let's be honest about it. But what Jesus says, and what God says, and what we must say, is, listen, we don't know all the answers to this, but we will walk alongside you. All the way through this, we will walk alongside you. And that's what Jesus is about in our lives, I think. So, the transition we mentioned comes through this active, continuing presence of God and of our Lord Jesus by means, by the action of the Spirit, which is introduced in, in the second uh, chapter of Acts, <coughs> more, most particularly, you know, this, this influx, this emergence of power and the breath of God purposely to further his kingdom at this, at this particular moment in, in history, really. Um, and, and we know how that Jesus had to be ascended. He had to leave a physical body, so that he could be present in spirit body, everywhere present. And we have to believe that that's still true today. And it's this kingdom, this promise of Jesus that I will come again, that is occupying the minds of the apostles now, as they come into Acts chapter 1. And they're, and they're all about saying, well, give us a road map again, I want more information. So is this going to be the time? Is it going to happen like this? Are the Romans involved? And what's happening to the, to the kingdom of Israel and so on? And, um, you know, will it happen like this? And as we read this, we see how that Jesus is really trying to 
talk to them about a much bigger picture. It's, it's not about thinking and worrying about times and dates and this happening and that happening. It doesn't really matter like that. Because there's, there's an underlying message, or there's a more important message, it seems to me anyway, of what Jesus is trying to get the disciples, the apostles, to think about. And I think it's these three things, and we'll, this is kind of intro into, into what's happening in Acts chapter 3. What Jesus is really trying to get the dis- apostles to, to, to focus on is less about detail and roadmaps and <coughs> times and dates and stuff. It's about three things. Number one is trust the Father. Trust the Father. He alone knows and you can utterly believe and trust Him. Second thing, witness to the Son. Witness to me, Jesus. Witness to the Son. Tell the story. Tell people everywhere, even to the ends of the earth. And you be part of this story. You are my church. I want to, you know, through you, this gospel is going to be spread. So be part of this story. And the third thing is, you need to be open to the Spirit, my presence, alive in your lives. The ongoing work of Jesus. We talked about the initial outpouring at Pentecost. But accepting that, also realising that they don't do these things in their own strength, because it would never happen. They need to realise that what they are asked to do and how they do it is part of God working in them and through them. So they had to learn to be receptive, to be alive to this working through uh, uh, concept. We see how that Jesus again in in John chapter 14 is saying listen you are can, you've seen what I can do and you're going to be doing the same things if you ask you'll receive it I won't hold back um, <clears throat> so let's have a look at uh, Acts chapter 3 um, and use this as an example perhaps of, um, uh, of, of what we're just talking about there so this is the healing of the lame beggar this is the guy who asked for arms and he got legs. <laughs> so remember that Jesus, uh, sorry, the disciples had been with Jesus many times in many similar circumstances to the ones that they're just going to encounter right now. And would hopefully have learned through observation because that's very much part of the culture, the Jewish culture of the rabbi and 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 uh, and his pupils, as it were. They 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 walk alongside. They learn through observance of what's happening. And again, that's something that we pick up in John chapter 14. I tr- I tell you, whoever believes in me will do works that I have been doing. It says there. And not only that, you'll do even greater things than these it says. So, Jesus is kind of preparing them for this. What you've seen me do, you're going to be able to do as well, but even better, almost. So, there's a combination of things happening on on different levels in this little incident of the lame beggar. On one hand, there's the practical, immediate necessity to minister to somebody who is in need, to deal with a problem. This chap is over 40 and every day of his life he's been put at this particular spot to beg uh, and, and there's an immediate need there's a physical problem that needs to be dealt with but on the other hand also there's a much bigger story to tell um, if you think back to um, it reminded me a little bit of the, uh, the incident where Jesus healed the blind man in uh, John chapter 9 remember the whole of John chapter 9 is occupied by that story of the blind uh, boy I suppose he is um, and, and the disciples there are asking do you remember they're asking lots of theoretical theology questions about the healing that Jesus undertakes they're saying to him tell us Jesus is this something to do with the fact that he sinned or his parents sinned? Is it something to do with the law? And can we just investigate that a little bit because I'm quite interested in all that. And Jesus is saying, 
hang on a minute, all well and good, but do you know what? This person is standing before you, us, and we have the ability to do something. Let's do it. We have a been, uh, an opportunity to show the glory of the Father in this circumstance, and that's, let's concentrate on that, shall we? Lift your thinking to a bigger plane, to a higher thought, to a broader spectrum of what the power of God is all about. Because that incident, and these as well, all of them really, are signs, aren't they? They tell us more than the immediate healing. This is about an opportunity with the blind boy to show, the, the talk about and reveal this this coming alive again, the, the emergence of light out of darkness, being able to see again um, the glory of the Lord. So there's a much bigger picture to be uh, to, to tell. So <clears throat> I guess the lesson for us may be to say, don't get overstressed and don't get to a point where um, we're so focused on theological questions of truth and study and all that that we miss the opportunity to evidence the glory of God and the kingdom because that's what matters more than anything to trust the Father to witness to the Son to be alive to their continued presence and working out through us these are the things that matter so in Acts chapter 3 we've got a similar sort of event with this blind beggar fellow and this time uh, as we've read the apostles were um, heading off to the temple it's three o'clock they want to get to the prayer meeting and these are the two disciples Peter and John who are the fastest running disciples remember these are the guys who, who are the sprinters because <laughs> in the back of uh, remember when they these are the two that raced to the tomb and John the disciple that Jesus loved outran Peter and but let him in first and all this sort of stuff they're both running, running around and so on so these are the two uh, disciples capable of um, being somewhere on time, uh, you can trust them to be able to do that. So it's three o'clock service, and you can imagine they want to get there. And they're on the floor, and they almost trip over him uh, at this gate. He's so familiar, they just kind of almost trip over him, was this poor fellow. He'd been brought there, um, presumably, uh, to beg at this gate called Beautiful. And we learn in chapter four that he was about 40 years old, or he was in excess of 40 years old. I don't know why they capture that little bit of information, but that's fine. You imagine that <coughs> um, although he'd been at the door of the temple, he'd probably never been inside it. Perhaps he never wanted to, maybe. More likely it's because he's just not allowed to be inside the temple because of his disability. It, his disability made him an outcast socially and also spiritually. And so he's excluded by his condition. And he's sitting there at the gate called Beautiful. Now, there's something in, sort of interesting about the idea that this gate was called Beautiful. Uh, and you might know it. And let me tell you, um, the, the Greek f word for Beautiful Gate, right, is, I'll try and pronounce it, but it's something like Hooray-os Hooray-os Isn't that great? Hooray! <laughs> Seems to me A bit like hooray H-O-R-A-Y-O-S And if you look at um, Strong's Concordance the literal meaning of that has to do with belonging to the right time or the right season It's less to do with you know the fact that it's beautifully ordained I'm sure it probably was but apparently the word is, is, is all about right time, right season. That's the name of this gate. It was the right time gate, literally. And you just think about it. Jesus must have passed by there, through it, hundreds of times, probably, in his lifetime. And yet he's never healed that beggar. Why is that? Maybe the reason is because it was not the right time, Jesus. You know, all things 
it's the right time, it's not the right time. You know, several sort of ways in which that comes through in the Gospel, isn't there? But now is the right time. And Peter, he would have seen Jesus walking, he would have, through that gate, he would have known that cripple. Jesus would have known that cripple. Um, <clears throat> but again, here is the right time, here is the right moment, you sense, for this event to happen. And because of his encounter with the name of Jesus, there's an, there's an emphasis on it being the name of Jesus, that situation, his situation, of being excluded, of being marginalized, because of his condition, is transformed. The way into God has become opened to him. He's transformed by his encounter with Jesus, the beautiful one, from a situation of poverty, of lameness, of being downtrodden and socially excluded, spiritually excluded in the eyes of all mankind, effectively, to a place where he is restored, where he is on his feet again, where he is healed and rescued by the all-powerful name of Jesus. And if you think about the reaction that it causes, we read about it. The religious leaders in chapter 4, actually, we'll you know, have a look at it in a minute. The religious leaders thought that this Jesus was dead and gone and buried and that's it. Great sigh of relief. And now, look what's happened now. All of a sudden, he's back on the scene. Not visibly in person Jesus, but clearly he's still having an impact. What does it all point to? What's happened? What does it all mean? This name of Jesus is still changing lives. He's still turning the world of Jewish religion uh, on its head. If you have a look at chapter 4 and verse <coughs> 12, you see what I mean. Because the, the, the people, uh, sorry, Peter is saying, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Think how that would have rattled the, uh, the, the religious leaders. It wasn't good news to their ears. So let's just go back to uh, those three kind of elements that we just talked about before <coughs> as, we, as we kind of round up. First of all, Peter trusted. This was probably, I think it was, I'm, I may be wrong, but I think it was about the first healing miracle since Jesus was physically with them and now he isn't. He had to trust the Father at that moment he had to bring to trust that which Jesus had told him that he would be with them and together that they would turn this world upside down so there was an element of faith and trust on Peter's part so he trusted but then he also witnessed and it's a combination of the two things we need to be practical in our witness you know, as I said before the man needed healing he needed restoring. He needed help. But also, you p pick up from Peter how that he saw as an opportunity to witness by word as well as by deed. Verse 12 of chapter 3, Peter saw the opportunity and he addressed the crowd. And he addresses the crowd in, in uh, chapter 3 and verse 12. Uh, through to you know those four verses or so you know he addresses the crowd beautifully he sees the opportunity to witness and, and, he, and he absolutely goes for it and in those two or three verses three or four verses he kind of summarizes effectively the whole, the whole kind of gospel story he witnesses to Jesus as being the long awaited Messiah who was glorified by God he was righteous and holy he was the author is the author of life he has been resurrected he is the resurrected Lord and it's his name through which comes life and healing I mean effectively that is the gospel story isn't it, that is the Christian gospel in three or four kind of lines uh, from Peter he sees the opportunity and grabs it and then he's also open to the spirit that is within him and verse 12 again of chapter 3 why do you look at us 
as though we'd made this man walk by some power or godliness of our own. It's God who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. <coughs> so he's giving the glory elsewhere, not to himself. Here are the apostles heading to their temple service and being redirected in their attention. God had something for them to do. They were led by the Spirit. Jesus was at work ministering to a world in need at that time. Physically, but more so spiritually. And he was doing so through another body. The body of his church. That's how he's at work. Now was the right time to launch into this. And so the same thing happened, is, is relevant to us, I think. Um, says the same things. Just trust the Father in all that we do, in every moment. Witness to the Son by our lives, by our deeds, by our talk, by our opportunity. And be alive or receptive to the fact that Jesus is a living being his spirit is still with us you are his body on earth we the church are his body on this earth until he comes again and our role is to minister and to further the kingdom that he is still working towards as it were the fulfillment completeness of that kingdom so if any of that is the case we just need the time to absorb it perhaps but if, if that is absolutely the case and we're ready to believe it then you have to say that anything is possible anything is possible if we, sh if we really believe that Jesus is working through us in that way so does that excite us or does that worry us does that trouble us does it empower us what does it do we need to think about that reaction don't be troubled, I am still with you, says Jesus. I am with you through the suffering and the good times. Trust me, let your lives witness to me, be open and responsive to the concept that I am a living in you and through you for the glory of the Father. The encouragement to us, just to finish with, I think is, I picked it up in chapter 4 and verse 13. Uh, let me just read this. When they saw, the people saw uh, the, uh, the courage of Peter and John and they realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. It's like a cause and effect. Because Jesus was listened, there was an effect. It was noticeable. So let me just leave you with this question. What is it about who we are that would cause another to say or to take note that we have been with Jesus.